Good morning, members of parliament, support staff, visitors in the public tribune, radio listeners, TV viewers, and all those viewing via social media, as well as the members of the media. Good morning, all. I welcome you to this continuation of the public meeting number three for today, Thursday, March 7, 2024. I want to give a special welcome to Ms. Silvera Jacobs, the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs of the current caretaker cabinet of government and her support staff. We have established a quorum of 11 members. Please stand for a moment of silence. Thank you. I have received notice of absence from the members MP Egbert Duran and one of lateness from MP Roseburg. Does any member of parliament have a notification at this time? I see MP Otley requesting the floor. MP Otley, you have the floor. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning to my esteemed colleagues, those in the Tribune, and the uh, staff of GB and the Secretariat of the Government. Madam Chair, um, as GB is a very important meeting, we know this is a public meeting, and some may wonder, as Omar Atli is very vocal, why I don't speak in the meeting today. I would like to inform the public watching that this is a continuation of a public meeting that was held before I was a member of parliament. And according to the rules of order, if you did not speak in the first round, you will not be allotted time in the second round. So I want to inform the public of that, but I will listen keenly, I will pay um, serious attention, and if I am not satisfied, we will reconvene or recall a meeting. Um, however, I have been very critical of GEBE, um, even in my role in the executive branch, so I look forward to hearing the information brought forward today. Madam Chair, um, for my second notification, um, as I stated, I wear dual hats, and yesterday I was not able to attend the meeting um, due to my function as Minister of ASR. However, it was brought to my attention that the meeting pertaining to the committees and Paralatino was rescheduled to be handled or discussed in a central committee meeting. However, with us not knowing how long we will be in the executive branch, it is a bit strenuous with one, two, three, I think four, minutes, four MPs being ministers. I think with that being said, every meeting is indeed prudent. Um, from my knowledge of what I've been updated by my faction is one member would like to be added to a committee while one member would like to be taken off. I do not think that is something that we should hold a central committee meeting for. I think it's something that can be handled administratively. So I would like to make the best out of this meeting and propose that that be handled as an as agenda point to this OVA. So thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to propose that. Thank you. Thank you, MP Utley, for your notifications. And I look around to see. I do see that MP La Cruz has requested the floor for notifications. MP La Cruz, you have the floor. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, morning to the Prime Minister and GEB and my fellow members of Parliament and those in the Tribune. Uh, question, Madam Chair, is it since we are not allowed as new members because we did not, we were not able to write in on the list, the speakers list, would we be able to ask for clarifications? Because I've seen that that has happened before. Will that be allowed this time? MP um, La Cruz, the, I'm, going to answer, I'm going to answer your question. It's, um, it has been posed in notifications, but I will address the matter that you have raised. Okay, so, um, I'll, and also the matters raised as notification by MP Otley. I will address these matters and I will, you'll have a response to your question, MP Lacruz. 
D, I look to see if there are any other notifications. And that not being the case, allow me at this time to address, firstly, the, the point brought during notifications, because I think it's important, both points, all three points, in fact, brought by MPs Otley and MP La Cruz. One from MP Otley, yes, indeed, as the MP stated, it is important that the public realizes that this meeting that we're having today is a continuation meeting that started as a urgent public meeting requested by three members of parliament. That meeting started and we had persons who spoke and asked questions. Answers to these questions were provided to parliament in the month of January. 2024, so this year, and we need it now, we need now to continue in the second round, the Prime Minister in her capacity as Prime Minister, along with representatives of her cabinet as well as GEBE is here, considering that this is a public meeting to provide answers, to provide answers to the members of parliament. The, we discussed this matter in terms of the, how do we continue considering the fact that since this meeting started, the, we have a change in the composition of parliament. And it was deemed more efficient considering that we have received the answers in writing already that we finalize this meeting and only those who are still with us who spoke in the first round will be able to speak in the second round. And all members, groups of members have the opportunity, have the opportunity to of course request another meeting if deemed necessary, also based on the answers which have been provided to all members of parliament. However, every member of parliament at this meeting today can ask um, matters to be clarified as the answers are provided. So MP La Cruz, directly to your point, yes, any member can ask for a matter raised or elaborated on by the prime minister and her support staff that it be clarified. So yes, you may ask for that. In fact, all members have received an email to what I am explaining right now with respect to this meeting. So it was explained to all members. That's um, the matter of explaining why some members will not be able to speak um, in this second round or, or after we receive the answers from the first round, will not be able to, to speak to the topic, but can ask a clarification question. Coming back to the matter of the the meeting yesterday in which the Parliament of St. Martin received from the Central Committee, and it was exhaustively explained yesterday how we came to the proposals that were approved, so to speak, in the Central Committee, approved to be sent to the public meeting for the approval of the public meeting of Parliament. This meeting regarded the composition of the permanent and ad hoc committees of parliament, as well as the committees of the Par Latino organization. The, yesterday, in fact, just before the meeting, we received a request from a member of parliament that, M, that the MPB added to at least two to at least two committees of par Latino. So let me make it very clear. The committees of parliament ad hoc and permanent, the composition of those committees have been approved in the, in the meeting yesterday. So we received one regarding the par Latino committees to be added to the, to the committee, to the committees of par Latino. And subsequently, right after the starting time of the meeting, we received another communication from a member of parliament regarding these committees to be taken off from the list of proposals for the Par Latino committees. Not only that, the member of parliament in suggesting that, that she be taken off the list of the 
committees of Par Latino also suggested in her email that the entire matter of Par Latino and participation in Par Latino be looked at once again. This is not the first time that the Parliament of St. Martin has been deliberating the matter of our membership in Par Latino. And that is when it was decided that this matter, given the context of the email that we receive, which has to follow the procedures of being registered and directed to a committee, it is for this reason I put off the continuation of the agenda point number three of the meeting, which had to do with establishing the committees for Par Latino, committee membership for Par Latino. I also wish to recognize that I received a letter from MP Akim Arendel, actually asking for the matter of Par Latino committee membership to be added to this meeting today. Unfortunately, that's not possible. This is a meeting that is continuing for starters. And secondly, the meeting that was adjourned at agenda point number three, um, reference to the participation in Par Latino and more. So my MP Akim Arendel, you will be receiving an official response, of course, to your request, but I can inform you and members of parliament that unfortunately it's not possible to add the approval of the Par Latino committee memberships to this ongoing public meeting of parliament on GEBE. What I can respond to the members Otley and Arundel and all others who might be concerned, like I did yesterday, that there is no reason to prolong the decision on that matter for any length of time. And I will ensure that it is brought back to a public meeting of parliament where it has to be approved as soon as possible. So I hope to address the concerns of those who feel that the membership to Par Latino um, might be long in coming. No, that is absolutely not going to happen. So with that explanation, and for the explanation of the general public, once again, it's important that we recognize this meeting is a continuation of a meeting that started some months ago, definitely before the change in the composition of parliament. And the agenda point for this public meeting is deliberations on NVGB. It is registered on the IS060 of the parliamentary year 23-24, dated September the 29th of 2023. And I'm being asked to... Point of order, Madam Chair. Just a, just a request I'm asking just to know, based on what Member of Parliament Omar Utley asked in terms of a request, shouldn't it go to the floor for a vote or uh, second ten if he's requesting for it to be put as an agenda point? I'm just asking for knowledge base. Thank you. Um, thank you, MP. Uh, a very, a very valid question. Actually, the MP used notifications to make a point and a suggestion, to which I responded but it is not an official proposal that has been made and um, that has been made to be voted upon or otherwise. And again, I am going to close off the topic and the discussion regarding the Par Latino membership of the Parliament of St. Martin. As we continue and I... Who asked for a point of order? MP Otley, MP Otley, you have a point of order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Duly noted, um, although I said I have two notifications, in my second one I did say I propose. I did say that I propose it be handled. Um, noted again, MP, noted again, MP Otley, but you can be making an official proposal that will be put to voting in the notifications. I can only think that that is your proposal. That is your suggestion, your proposal, but I can't put it to a vote, I'm sorry. I continue with the agenda point for this public meeting and repeat again that it is the deliberations on NV, NVGB IS060 of the parliamentary year 23-24, dated 
dated September the 29th of last year. The meeting was requested by MPs Westcott Williams, Heiliger Martin, and Emmanuel. Going over to the agenda point for the meeting, it was on September the 29th of 2023 that Parliament received a letter, IS 060, from the members just mentioned, requesting that an urgent public meeting of Parliament be convened on the above mentioned agenda point. The presence of the minister was also requested in that letter. The meeting was convened on October the 11th, 2023, and after the opening remarks and presentation by the Prime Minister, MP Bryson's proposal to adjust the speaking time to 25 minutes in the first round and 15 minutes in the second round was approved. In accordance with the speakers list, members of parliament were then allowed to ask the Prime Minister questions in the first round. The meeting was then adjourned to allow the Prime Minister time to prepare the answers to the questions the members of Parliament posed. The continuation of this meeting was scheduled for November the 6th, 2023, but was postponed until further notice upon the request of the then President of Parliament. Hence, today is the continuation of this urgent public meeting. Today, the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Mrs. Silvera Jacobs, returns to Parliament to answer the questions posed by the members in the first round. I have explained why it will only be the members who spoke in the first round who will now be able to speak after the answers are provided. And as I mentioned earlier in response to a question, all members may ask for clarification on the answers given. So I would now give the floor to the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Silvera Jacobs, to answer the questions posed by members of Parliament in the first round. Madam Prime Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning to you. Good morning to my colleague, uh, members of Parliament here in the House of Parliament, the Secretary General, of course, the sa uh, support staff of the Government of St. Martin and my Cabinet staff, and the management of interim management and representative of the Board of NBGB joining us. Did I mention the Secretary General of COM? Yes. Cassandra Janssen. Um, I've listened to the discussions back and forth in terms of the questions, acts, etc. Of course, much of the questions had to be deliberated and handled by GB itself, and so it did take a lot longer than we had anticipated. So the questions or the answers have been provided. Oh, I had to stop. <laughs> I didn't catch Garrick's <laughs> bar. Madam Chair, may I adjourn for a moment to get the riser? We adjourn for two minutes to allow the Prime Minister to get her preparations in place.
Minister, you may continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now that the technical issues have been ironed out, besides me getting a podium, thank you, MP. Um, I would like to go back to what I was saying. Firstly, of course, good morning, and a special good morning to the people of St. Martin tuned in, as well as to those joining us here in the Tribune. I know this is a topic that has been very important to the people of St. Martin. Um, it has impacted us all, and of course, these answers, as I mentioned before, were prepared late last year. If uh, more updates are needed as to what the current situation is, of course, I expect that to come forward in the second round of questions. So take note that these were answers from the end of 2023. The question, as was posed by the first MP recorded, MP Westcott Williams, related to the 90% of the records of GB being restored, and if that is the case, uh, are they completely up to date? Is it so that only 10% are not and still needs to be filled in? What category does the 10% fall? The records are based in the responses received from NVGB. The records are based on both technical and client data. These must be restored and integrated for completeness. The ransomware incident of March 22 resulted in data loss up to and including February 2021. GB did not have any other backups at the time, and the data that is being restored is from that point forward. New clients move in and move out after February 21st, up until March 22, when this took place, are not properly registered in the system before the hack. Sorry. Sorry, and accounts not properly registered in the system before the hack are proving to be the most difficult to restore and reconcile. Let me go back over that because I myself didn't understand what I said. So I repeat that part. Prime Minister, while you are going to go back over that, I just want to give the number of the IS that was provided to Parliament with the answers of the Minister. And that is IS 345 of the 25th of January 2024. For the members of Parliament, IS 345. Madam Prime Minister, you may continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, as I said, the data that is being restored is from the point of February 2021 20, to March 2022, specifically, especially new clients move in and move out after February 21, 2021, and accounts that were not properly registered in the system before the hack are proving to be the most difficult to restore and reconcile. The last 10% entails domestic as well as commercial clients. It consists of missing technical information, and GB is currently updating the system to be able to build these customers. I, had a, I heard recent updates on this answer that is more current, so I'm sure we'll be able to update that as we move on in the meeting. Question two was regarding persons with outstanding amounts, for whatever reason, being asked to pay 25%. Where is that plan now? Did GB ever have the opportunity? Did persons ever have the opportunity of their outstanding as announced by Minister VSI and GB? Does that plan still stand? A policy was put in place by the current management to allow persons who were delinquent in payment for the month GEB did not send invoices to receive a payment plan based on a 25% payment. Thereafter, the client makes six payments to clear the delinquency and stay up to date with billing. That policy will be reviewed, or I should say was reviewed, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, considering many clients who never made any payments and now are more than 18 months in delinquency. GB understands the hardships involved for some of these clients. However, the financial position of the company and the need to act consistently with all clients necessitates repayment, albeit via a payment plan. As such, the plan requiring 25% with six payments thereafter is still in force, is still in force, and will continue to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So that does not mean that persons who are not able to do the six months would not be able to make other arrangements. But the standard is this policy. So GB continue to review on a case-by-case -case basis. Persons wishing to make arrangements for their outstanding bills should go to GEB's offices. With said payment arrangements, the client must also be able to 
pay the current bills to avoid increasing arrears. So again, all of that is on a case-by-case -case basis, and the management will update in the second round how that is going now since these answers were provided. The third question was where do we stand on the financial situation of the company and the senior plans, given the viability of the financial situation? The, uh, the MP asked whether the senior plan was still possible and whether the relief that seniors enjoyed um, giving senior relief amounts, it's a statement, I'm not sure. Oh, this was quoted in the past, of up to 500,000 guilders. Can it be still applied? GB's financial situation remains tenuous. In addition, the loss in revenue due to the hack and the length of the restoration process requires the company to operate on a bare bones budget into financial year 2024. Moreover, the company needs to make serious inroads in clearing the maintenance backlog of its production and distribution network. The financial demands on cash flow must therefore be considered. GB will reinstate this as soon as possible and have one-on-one -on -one discussions with shareholders to find a viable solution. I can update that that is one of the areas that was updated and this plan now seems more feasible for implementation moving forward. That is an update to this answer. Does GB have an overview of current outstanding broken down commercial and residential clients? Yes, GB has an overview of current outstanding broken down clients. 44.84% are commercial and 42.62% are residential clients. Industrial clients make up 12.55%. Please take note that the numbers were rounded to the second decimal point. And this was the information provided last year. The MP also queried whether GB is able to pay for fuel to Sol and where we stood on that matter. GB's management prioritized this matter since taking office in September of 2022 and is currently no longer delinquent with Sol. Six, no further, no numbers were provided on the financials. How many, how does the company presently financially speaking, um, how does the company look presently? Financially speaking, what about the payments to the employees, which was an ongoing discussion with NBGB? Where does that stand? The company is maintaining a net positive flow of cash, a cash flow position, based on the restoration of the billing, collections are being are much improved from late 2022. The expenses are managed to account for the reduced income or revenue. GB's management has built limited cash reserves for operations and unforeseen situations such as the unforeseen repairs to the machinery and other urgent issues. Management is working to erase the backlog in financial statements that were present at the company in September of 22. Specifically, GB completed its 2019 financial statements in early 2022. Management expects the auditors to complete the work on financial year 2020 and 2021 by the end of 2023. And I'm being updated that the draft was presented. Financial year 22 and 23 will be finalized during, it was stated back then, quarter one of 2024. There has been no interruption of payment of wages and salaries. What about the payment to the employees, COLA and merit increase? Agreements have been reached in principle with the unions for the merit increase of financial year 2022. This will be paid in two installments, one in January 2024 and one in January 2025. The one in January 2024 was paid out the COLA calculation is being completed and the SMCU has informed management that this increase should be paid in full in 2024. However, discussion on the cost of living adjustment is still ongoing. Referencing the CFO of the company and a court case that was won by the CFO, where does that stand? GB is not aware of any court case that a CFO won. And for clarity's sake, the CFO's last term ended in 2020. In 2017, the energy utility sector was added to BTP. Based on that addition, is there an understanding that BTP is supposed to, of what BTP is supposed to do towards GEBE? If not, why? And if there is an understanding, what has DP, 
BTP done as far as the utility company is concerned. In 2017, BTP was commissioned by the then sitting ministers of Rami and Tiat to do a market research and update on the energy policy to make suggestions on how best to assign the regulatory work or task to BTP for the utility sector. A findings report was submitted to Minister Tayat along with an advice on how they saw this most feasible in the current market. That was in 2017. A constant change of ministers in Tiat has contributed to the delay in any response. The Council of Ministers instituted an energy work group in 2021 that has been tasked with energy related matters, for instance, energy policy, transition to renewable energy, energy roadmaps, and the EU Kingdom funding for renewable energy related projects. This amendment, in addition to updating the current energy policy, has also been highlighted as a priority for the energy work group and the ministries of Tayat, Vromi, and General Affairs. For BTP, to become the regulatory body for the utility sector, an amendment needs to be made to the current legislation, the Lands for Ordinary. This can only be done with some form of supporting documentation. This process has not been completed and is under review by the Ministry of Tayat in collaboration with BTP. Again, a high volume of, num of rotating ministers in the function continues to be a critical component of this transition. A key development related to the process has been a recent visit of technical experts from TNO, the Dutch Organization for Applied Scientific Research, that focused on assessing the current state of affairs on the island as it relates to the Netherlands, being able to subsidize existing projects or initiatives relating to the transition to renewable energy, such as solar, wind, uh, via the SDE plus funds and other funds available via the Netherlands, as I've discussed here before. GB, in the meantime, with the assistance of funding from the World Bank through the NRPB, has also started their tender process to outsource a grid studies and integrated resource plan, IRP. The results of these studies will provide a necessary insight into the current state of GEBE's power generation and distribution networks and that are required to advance on our renewable energy projects and general infrastructure upgrades required to support growth of new energy generation. BTP, in the meantime, remains in close contact with the Ministry of Tayat, uh, the Minister of Tayat, regarding the necessary process to make the amendments to the legislation to appoint BTP as a regulator of the National Utility Company. Question 10 from MP Westcott Williams. Long-term solutions, can the Prime Minister and GB be more specific and what does that mean for the current outages and load shedding. How much longer will we experience these? What time frame? Um, in what time frame can these solutions be implemented? As mentioned briefly before, <clears throat> GB is currently collaborating with the World Bank and NRPB to complete an investment plan. The scope for GEBE's investment plan will be executed in a two-phased approach. The first phase will focus on resolving the urgent needs and developing a least cost power development plan, LCPDP. The assignment will commence or commenced in December 2023 and is expected to be concluded three months later. The LCPDP is for a 10-year horizon starting in 2024 and will provide recommendations for developing the optimal expansion plan for the generation and transmission system of GB, focusing on the island supply options and ambition for renewable integration. The optimal exp expansion will minimize the expected net present value of investment, operating costs, and cost of non-supply demand over the period from a country's perspective, subject, of course, to risk-based constraints regarding minimum reliability and maximum operation costs. The company has engaged a consultant through the NRPB who will assist in conducting a crucial feasibility study. This study aims to identify the most suitable form of renewable, in renewable energy based on existing infrastructure. It will also assess whether upgrades are necessary to integrate renewable energy sources. And the study also considers the company's current installed capacity present peak demand of 56.4 watts megawatts, as well as the ongoing growth of the island impacting or reliability criteria. 
Consequently, the focus will be on expanding GEB's generating capacity, installed capacity to meet the rising demand. These efforts towards the progress, growth, and sustainability of NVGB aligns with the government's vision through its roadmap towards renewable energy. To support this vision, funding was made available through the Emergency Recovery Project 1, ERP1, of the St. Martin Trust Fund, and the short term to address the current issue of load shedding, GB is in the process of reviewing the possibility of leasing additional mobile engine capacity to cover the shortfall in electricity supply. In addition to this, the COM approved roadmap for the transition to renewable energy is being taken along by those doing the feasibility study. The GB business plan is currently being updated. MB Westcott asks further, and the Energy Work Group is updating the plan. There is an energy plan in which the role of GB is detailed. Is that energy plan being followed? What was done is being done. Who is the Energy Work Group and what does that mean in terms of time, money, and what the people of St. Martin can look forward to and when? GB has been falling behind in executing its role regarding the energy policy. The current management has acknowledged this shortcoming and has made staff available to be part of the work group. The group comprises of individuals from the Department of Interior and Kingdom Relations, BAC, Vromi, Teyat, and NVGB. The MP looks forward to concrete information, the status of load shedding, the status of employees, and a financial bottom line. NV's late, NVGB's latest auditive statements are for the year 2019 to avoid any possible misinterpretations, misrepresentations. GB management prefers to wait until the year 2020 and 2021. Audited statements are available and then these will be shared with Parliament. This will ensure that all the necessary information is accurate and up to date. To address the current issue of load shedding, GB is in the process of reviewing, I mentioned this before, the additional mobile engine capacity. MP Rumu asked if uh, that customer, consumers are still reporting receiving inaccurate bills. Are the, there any different steps being taken by NVGB to address these discrepancies and finally ensure that the billing is accurate? GB informs that it is monitoring its billing system to ensure that no accurate bills are sent out. However, they have identified that some accounts are still contain some inaccuracies dating back to their inception, so since the beginning, not just from the hack. Additionally, some customers who move frequently two or three times per year run the risk of not having their accounts closed off properly, resulting in continued billing based on their old meter. This is being addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. So I know that up to this week, I did hear of persons who had discrepancies in bills, and they are asked to just return to GB to have these um, reassessed and provide the information to have it fixed. Many consumers are still not receiving bills, was mentioned. Can NVGB explain the reason behind this one and a half years later, what measures are being implemented to rectify this? The records are based on both technical and client data. These must be restored and integrated for completeness. I think the integration is the main challenge. The ransomware incident resulted in data loss up to and including, I think I mentioned this answer before. Um, so therefore, several accounts were not properly registered in the system before the hack are proving to be difficult to reconcile. And VGB is still working on that last 10%. And while they had hoped to finish this by the end of last year, it still remains uh, an ongoing work in progress. So it entails mostly technical information, and they are updating the system to build the customers accurately. So any persons receiving bills that may be inaccurate, please report this to GB ASAP. The recent episodes of load shedding are greatly impacting both residents and businesses in St. Martin. What actions are NVGB taking in the short term and long term to prevent such incidents? There are ongoing talks with the engine manufacturer Watsila about updating the power plant's capacity to meet the N2 criteria, a standard for system reliability. 
the N2 criteria is a standard in the energy sector, ensuring that a power system can handle the failure of two major components, like generators or transmission lines, without the system breaking down. GB has 10 generators and 50 lines. Our system should still work even if two generators and two lines go down simultaneously. This ensures that GB can provide continuous power, preventing the widespread blackouts, even if multiple parts fail. Maintaining this standard is about being prepared and ensuring a stable power supply no matter what challenges may arise. NVGB is working on comprehensive internal plans for immediate as well as future actions. GB is currently working on a short-term solution to avoid interruptions in power supply. Implementing these will give the company some breathing room while work is completed on the long-term strategies. These strategies will be integrated into the company's broader plans especially given the fast-paced changes in the energy world. Question four from MP Ramu. Given the outcry of the citizens, how is NVGB enhancing its customer service, especially in light of many complaints about the discrepancies and outages? NVGB is gearing to launch a new communication campaign that will address its customers' concern by connecting with the communities. The company is currently in the final stages of negotiating with customer care experts to enhance its customer experience. What plans does NVGB have in place to ensure consistent electricity access to all of St. Martin, including the more remote areas, seeing that certain areas are always left without electricity or the first to lose electricity during outages? This was question five from MP Ramu. Consistent electricity supply to all of St. Martin is crucial. The N2 criteria concept ensures redundant power generation to meet demand even when the two generators are not, uh, when two generators are not operational. However, it is concerning that NVGB lacks this redundancy resulting in N minus two is what I should be saying, N minus two, which is the description of two engines or lines being down. However, it is concerning that NVGB currently lacks this redundancy, resulting in frequent load shedding and power outages, especially in areas with high load demand. Currently, NVGB does not have any redundancy or spinning reserve when a large generator trips, leading to load shedding. To avoid a complete blackout, an under-frequency protection system is in place. And these are very technical statements, which I don't, no, the general public will understand, but in any case, these are the answers that were provided by NVGB. The under frequency protection system is a crucial safety measure that prevents widespread blackouts by systematically switching out parts of the power grid when there is a deficiency in power generation. The outline steps from step one to step four demonstrate a gradual escalation of response to dropping power frequencies with specific areas being affected more or less depending on the severity of the frequency drop. To address the current challenges, NVGB in, uh, needs to invest in new generators as soon as possible to support the N-2 concept and ensure a consistent supply of electricity to the entire island. There's a breakdown in the steps one, two, three, and four that the system goes through. Madam Chair, um, whether it's uh, for three seconds, it's very, very technical. So what I can say is that currently step one is being skipped because of smaller generators. So skipping when there's a slight drop, which can affect uh, the areas of Airport Road, Madam Estate, and Illage Road. Step two is characterized by areas with high load and demand, which is the Belvedere, Colby Lagoon, Saunders area, which is um, activated when there's a drop in frequency for 0.1 seconds. Step, that step two, because of the N minus two concept is not yet a reality, this step is disrupted more frequently. When it comes to deciding which steps, which areas to turn off outside of the steps in the under frequency protection system, various factors are taken into consideration. So for instance, I mentioned step one and step two, which areas, step three, 
would impact after five seconds. Um, St. Peter's, Oyster Pond, one, Indigo Estates at Cay Bay, Port of Plaisance, Simpson Bay, Red Pond, one, Lions Den, Towers, and Over the Bank. And if it gets to step four, that it's eight seconds, the rest of the cables on the, on the frequency protection system are then impacted. So various factors are taken into consideration, which include but are not limited to the potential output of private backup generators, the, the presence of schools in the affected areas, and the main water distribution pumps and other relevant factors. So that those things are weighed when deciding which areas would be turned off. What is GB doing about low water pressure to 40, 50 homes in the hills? The exact location of the low pressure is not specified. If someone experiences low pressure, they should inform customer care department so that the distribution operations team can investigate and rectify the issue. GB ensures a minimum pressure of two bars at the distribution point, which is at the water meter. Due to the extensive construction on the island, GB has noticed an increase in consumption. Additionally, those who live in the hills and consume more water may experience a decrease in pressure. There are several technical reasons why low pressure can occur. However, if the specific location is identified, the reason for that specific one um, can be determined by NVGB and a more accurate explanation can then be provided. MP Remove further asks which strategies are, it, are NVGB, is NVGB utilizing to ensure the Infrastructure is adequately equipped to handle increasing energy demands, seeing the island's growth. It is important to know that NVGB is not consulted regarding large infrastructure projects ahead of time. They usually learn about these projects primarily through the local newspapers and media websites, especially during groundbreaking events for large-scale projects. The company is notified when the project developer requests the construction meter and presents the infrastructure requirements based on the anticipated load demand. The current management of GB is in the process of developing a long-term strategy. As part of this process, they have requested the Ministry of Roaming to provide them with the projected inventory for the next 24 months. This information will help NVGB to make more accurate projections of its capacity needs. Was there, and I thought a break was being requested. Question eight, how is NVGB working to improve its communication strategies, especially during unplanned outages and or emergencies? NVGB has remained steadfast in the company's unwavering commitment to serve the community with quality and reliable water and electricity services and through interactive communication efforts. Though in some cases, I must say, we have been quite uh, concerned about communication um, and asked for an increase in communication to the public in the unforeseen event of service disruptions and or outages, NVGB's team goes above and beyond their regular work schedules and resolve any respective challenges and also provide ongoing community updates via social media newspaper notices, WhatsApp platforms to all media outlets, including radio stations, newspapers, and TV 15. And I must say, yes, I've seen it also on their Facebook page, social media. Considering these many challenges, there are major overhauls or strategic shifts being discussed to enhance service delivery. This was the question. GB is currently collaborating with World Bank and NRPB to complete an investment plan. The scope for the investment plan will be executed in two phases, as I mentioned a bit earlier, and has a 10-year projection, looking at it from 2024 to 2034. The optimal expansion will minimize the expected net present value of investment operating costs and costs of non-supply demand over the period from a country's perspective, subject to risk-based constraints regarding minimum reliability and maximum operation costs. They have engaged a consultant, as I mentioned before, through the NRPB, who is assisting with the crucial feasibility study. Madam Chair, with your permission, I won't repeat answers, especially since several members did ask the same questions, and they are printed and projected as well. 
so I wouldn't want to bore the listening public. Renewable energy sources is a growing global priority, and in presentation, um, the MP requested, you indicated that GB is considering renewable energy, what alternative models or energy sources are being considered, and is there a timeline for implementation? <coughs> As part of the ongoing efforts to modernize NVGB's infrastructure and ensure consistent and reliable power delivery to residents and visitors, along with the NRPB, GB will jointly undertake the development of a comprehensive investment plan. Uh, the timeline for this was not mentioned. This is asked by several uh, MPs, and so I will see whether within the round two we can give a more accurate um, outline of the timeline in terms of the implementation. One of the questions did mention that the first quarter would uh, the feasibility study would be finalized in the first quarter of this year. So the management informs that the feasibility study officially started yesterday. So once we have that study, then you'll be able to put forward the dates, et cetera. Has NVGB conducted any internal audits or assessments to ensure its operations run transparently? The primary task of the current management when they took office in September of 22 was to perform a current state assessment on what had happened in March 2022. The rec excuse me, the recommendations were converted into a short-term plan, which management is currently executing. Operations are transparent as management constantly communicates, reports, and held, holds meetings with the supervisory board of directors. Are these plans to engage St. Martin's community in feedback sessions regarding NVGB services to ensure direct redressal of incident resident concerns and VGB is in a constant and direct contact with the community to address customer um, concerns with an open door policy. Also utilizing telephone, email, live chat, social media, and moreover direct assistance, through direct assistance. Additionally, NVGB will introduce a comprehensive public information series uh, entitled NVGB connects with the community or connects the community this initiative has been developed to provide pertinent information with clarity and transparency based on the company's operational policies and procedures. The purpose of NVGB Connects the Community is to educate, engage, and build understanding among our valued customers and the community of St. Martin, as per the statement of management. Vital inf company information will be disseminated through direct information sessions with the communities as well as print, digital and social media outlets. Given the recent challenges, MP Rumo further asks, is NVGB considering any relief programs or incentives for affected consumers? I think that answer was given um, earlier in a response to MP Westcott, questions two and three, but I can add that, as mentioned uh, just recently, that the senior relief program is uh, being restarted. Is NVGB seeking collaborations with regional or international energy providers or experts to gain insights or support its ongoing challenges? As a matter of fact, NVGB is a member of CARILEC, which is the Caribbean Electric Utility Services Cooperation, and takes part in <clears throat> regional conferences within the region, including Curacao, Aruba, St. Eustatius, and other Caribbean partners. MP Bryson asked, um, reflected on some ongoing challenges that clients had and how it negatively impacts society and employees being emotionally affected. The MP thanked the employees. What is the current situation in terms of the negotiations for COLA? Et cetera, and that these employees are an integral part of NVGB. What attention 
is GB giving to that? Is it a cost factor? And how the MP wanted to know how members of parliament could contribute. The COLA is momentarily being looked into, as I mentioned in a previous answer. The company is making the necessary calculations and having discussions with the unions and continues to also engage with their employees. What happens moving forward in reference to court cases, the MP stated that it seems like Temer Daniel won court cases. Is the relationship so strained? No solution can be found. Monies are now found on legal fees, but also penalties. Will there be a resolution, either part ways or come back to work? The MP senses that the situation is in limbo and is important for the viability of GB. NVGB is actively working on solutions that will ensure the best outcome for the company and its staff. It is imprudent to discuss ongoing court cases and to clarify, Mr. Temer no longer works for, Ms. for NVGB. Three, referencing the financials, 43,000 accounts done by hand. How is it possible to come up with an accurate billing? There must be some provision that there will be human error. A bad debt provision is GB looking into this. Is there a fund to absorb the difference in billing? It needs to be clear. I must say that this was also a discussion held with um, the Council of Ministers and NVGB in terms of what could be done. Um, GB has reiterated that until the complete restoration of the system is complete, and GB has been able to address payment issues, including potential payment plans, it won't be possible to provide an accurate figure. However, they have made provisions for bad debt. An estimated amount was included in the 2023 budget and again in the 2024 budget. A conservative approach will be used as GB intends to seek restitution for outstanding payments in the first instance. However, again, as I mentioned, in the Council of Ministers meeting, the last one that was held, we did ask GEBE to look into making some other adjustments in how far back they were going with billing is concerned. Um, another issue that they brought forward is that the government of St. Martin was in no position at the time to subsidize their income or loss of income from giving these, uh, what would you call that? Um, bad debt provisions to certain clients. The question was asked on the 2020 and 2021 financial statements, a status update, and the financial, the current or the actual financial situation, where the government can see what that is based on 2019 it still looks like a healthy company. 2020 and 2021 audited financial statements were completed in December of 23. GB aims to be fully current with its audits 22 and 23 by mid 24. And we must also note that the 2019 audit was only completed in March of 2022. So the question as to whether it's a healthy company at the moment, you're able to meet your obligations. Um, GB is able to meet its obligations currently, but of course, consistently not making the revenues that should be coming in due to the billing situation. Is um, the same question number five seems to be the same as question three about the bad debt situation. 2019, question six was the last financials uh, prior to the cyber attack, GB has released its financial latest financial statements for 2019, which had already indicated some non-compliance issues. The cyber attack only added to the existing delays. However, we anticipate that, and this has been done, that 21 and 20 would be finalized by December of 2023. The financial health of GB, liquidity cash flow sufficient for payment of employees and vendors. There is insufficient cash, however, to execute all the needed, needed capital expenses, such as additional engine capacity. On solvency, there are no current long-term loans. Short-term liabilities are prioritized for payment. It should be emphasized that when the current management team took over at GB, September 22, the company was on the brink of collapse. Financial projections indicated that GB would go bankrupt by December 2022. However, thanks to the efforts of the current team, 
the situation has been turned around through improved strategies. So there is now sufficient cash flow to be able to pay the vendors as well as the employees. If you could remember at that time, we were building up arrears to solve, which have now been um, addressed. How much was spent due to the ICT hacking? Are we below the cap or over? Prior to the arrival of temporary management, several contracts and arrangements related to the March 22 cyber incident were initiated. Unfortunately, these were not all optimized to provide a solution. But because of the nature of the contract, some were honored in full, and for others, negotiated settlements were necessary. Several new service contracts were entered into with providers for enhanced monitoring and backup services. A new cybersecurity fabric infrastructure is being implemented and is more than 75% complete. Several vendors are working with NVGB's commercial department to support the restoration process, and others are actively assisting in system management. Moreover, forensic services were contracted for both the 2022 and 2023 cyber incidents. Question nine, billing of documents. Several questions seem to center around the bad debt provision. So this question is asking whether GB has a policy and how far back it goes for uncollectible or written off. The MP personally thought that it should be going back to Hurricane Irma. Does this happen often or is this an isolated situation? He further wanted to know. The company has a policy of actively pursuing outstanding billing revenues. They have a provision for bad debt, which is typically 0.5% and can be, can be higher in the case of natural disasters, one to 2%. Due to the impact of the Black Bite ransomware, the provision has been increased to 5% to account for a higher risk of non-payment. Bills have been generated for each account from March 22 up to the present time. There are no cutoffs or uncollectible amounts that have been written off to date for this period of time. The only missing information is for one year, which is currently being recreated. Any outstanding amounts prior to March 2021 are still recorded in our system as a receivable that needs to be collected. So that is in NVGB's system. So to clarify, persons who had who owe GB prior to the hack still in the system as owing GB. Energy is um, question 10 from the MP. Are there any plans even for current fuel or cleaner fuel that may be more expensive? What is GB's policy on that part? What percentages uh, these small islands contribute to the CO2 output? It was a question that was asked in Bonaire. Basically, it was a very low amount. MP believes that the focus should be on the cost for the consumer. How is GB choosing its current form of fuel cost based on clean fuel? NVGB has been diligently searching for the most viable solution for St. Martin, focusing not only on renewable energy through our ongoing feasibility study, but also exploring alternative fuel options. This approach aims to substantially decrease our company's carbon footprint and lower costs for our customers. That's the ultimate goal. One potential cleaner alternative fuel is liquefied natural gas, LNG. However, given the current market prices, LNG may not be as attractive from a pricing perspective. This conclusion is drawn from the insights gain at a recent annual S&P Global Energy Commodity Insights event, which was held in the Dominican Republic in 2023. The primary challenges facing LNG in the Caribbean region revolve around political considerations, return on investment, logistics, and pricing based on the production plant's capacity in terms of megawatts. Converting to liquefied natural gas, LNG, and establishing LNG infrastructure demands a substantial investment, typically ranging from approximately 50 to 150 million US dollars. Potential solutions <clears throat> have been proposed concerning the logistics, such as utilities pooling resources to attract LNG suppliers. Furthermore, considering the challenges mentioned above, transitioning to LNG may not be financially viable for utilities with production capacities below 100 megawatts. Specific studies have indicated that the return on investment in such cases 
cannot be justified and it would therefore not meet the goal of reducing the cost to the consumers. Has GB different solutions for the billing situation? It is currently a manual process and putting the info in a different system. There is namely another way, namely the historical based assessment. For example, you go back two years when the billing was as accurate as possible. The MP further stated whether some sort of assessment be made instead of building a whole new system. Is government of St. Martin also going to take the financial burden? GB pays six to seven million in concession. In 2024, the MP suggested to defer a portion of the concession to deal with the bad debt, invoices, employees, etc. We also have a responsibility similar to the Enya case he mentioned. Are any of these possibilities viable? The company has a policy of actively pursuing outstanding billing revenues. It has a provision for bad debt, which is typically 0.5%, as I mentioned before, and can be higher uh, in cases of natural disasters, 1% to 2%, but as a result of black bite has been increased to 5 Bills, yeah, I think I said all that already. The company did not um, address the historical base assessment and whether that could be used. So that is something to take note of for further clarity in the next round. MP Richardson, Hyacinth Richardson asked uh, or made a statement that GB cut the wrong senior citizen. In addition, that the citizen paid a surplus on her account. These are things that should be and can be avoided and should make sure that they cut the right persons. I can wholeheartedly agree with that, and GB apologizes to the senior citizen and any others impacted by the recent uh, disconnections that were done erroneously. The company regrets any distress the situation may have caused and is committed to ensuring it does not happen again. GB recognizes the importance of discussing such matters in Parliament for transparency and accountability but at the same time, the company feels it's important to balance this with the need to protect customers' privacy. In this spirit, GB requests that any member of parliament having uh, affected individuals' data to forward that to GB's management and customer care so that it can be dealt with with the necessary um, protection of the customer's privacy. Um, and requested that that be sent after the meeting that was held back then or alternatively guide the customer to contact GB's customer care directly. I can say I myself have forwarded names and contact contract numbers to the management to follow up and the persons did get the follow up they needed. Of course it shouldn't be. That person should have to go to the management to get their challenges resolved. And so um, we have also asked NVGB to ensure that their customer care uh, employees are uh, able to deal with the challenges and the queries that come from the public, especially where errors are concerned. With the customer's contract information, the staff will then investigate the account, and if we can confirm that errors were made, these will be rectified. GB remains commitment, committed sorry, to improve its services and communication. It is dedicated to resolving the problems that have arisen by strengthening the trust and confidence of its customers. It appreciates the parliaments as well as the public's understanding and cooperation in these efforts and has been making strides to improve in that service area. The MP further thanked me for the presentation, that it was elaborate and much needed, and also suggested that GB look at all possibilities to ensure that they can take care of this saga to financially help the domestic homeowners. Um, MP would like to, GB to look into this as many of them cannot pay. A policy was put in place by the current management to allow persons who were delinquent in payments and who did not send invoices uh, for the months that GB did not send invoices to receive a payment plan based on a 25% payment. Thereafter, the client makes six payments to clear the delinquency. As I mentioned before, this is reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So if persons are found not to be able to, based on their current obligations, to be able to do it in six months, 
they have to, of course, bring in proof of that, and GB will then um, peruse that to come to an amicable solution on a case-by-case -case basis. This is, of course, to ensure that we can, or GB, can continue to meet its financial obligations to its employees and the like. The senior plan, during the fiscal years 23 and 24, it was not budgeted. Um, sorry. Where is the senior plan? Was it budgeted? What is the status? It's a question. And the response was that the subsidies were not budgeted due to the constraints in GB's income revenue. But as I mentioned before, um, at the start of this year, it was ascertained that they would be renewing that um, and we will be informed when. The MP also asks that the court cases not linger too long and GB thanks the MP for his input. MP Helga Martin asks what is the financial viability of the company. I think I answered that in MP Bryson's, uh, the liquidity cash flow sufficient for payments to employers, employees and vendors, insufficient cash at the moment to execute needed capital expenditures. The solvency has no, there are no long-term goals, uh, I'm sorry, no long-term loans, and the short-term liabilities have been prioritized for payment. And the situation, the financial situation has turned around drastically from September 2022 to now. The decisions being made since the hack are they financially sound? All the decisions being made since the hack are made with the precarious situation in mind. The company is still able to take care of its short-term liabilities and has engaged several um, consultants during that period of time to ensure that all bases were covered. Since the hack from 2020, how many employees, consultants have been hired and private entities, entities have made agreements with what was the reason for hiring new employees in SAHAC and what are the financial implications? Since March 2022, after the hack, the following positions have been filled at NVGB, and this is ranging from March 2023 to October 2023. Electrical and instrument technician B, payroll administrator, shift operators B, two of them for the water plant, warehouse dispatcher, Supervisor, meter administrator, and stock control, assistant shift operator for the power plant, and five mechanics level C at the power plant, and one mechanic level B at the power plant. Due to retirements and or deaths, some positions were filled. The remaining positions aim to bring the production department up to standard. In today's complex business landscape, GB has strategically engaged consultants, ensuring accelerated recovery of its affected ICT infrastructure and systems to bolster its financial stability. It is understandable that there may be some skepticism towards hiring external consultants, particularly in environments where their value is questioned. However, in the case of GB, there is a perspective worth considering. Work at GB, like in many larger companies, is specialized. Tackling every ch challenge with an internal team can then strain the resources and divert the core team, the team away from core tasks, divert their attention away from core tasks. That is exactly the situation the temporary manager and his team found themselves confronted with six months after the hack. The consultants hired by GB bring years of specialized expertise to efficiently navigate complex challenges. And with them on board, GB staff could focus on the operational tasks, keeping the business functioning day to day. Our consultants, GB's consultants and staff, have clearly defined roles. The consultants support specialized challenges while the staff remains focused on maintaining the day-to-day -day business. In some cases, the consultants supplement and collaborate with the staff, leveraging the effectiveness of the organization. Furthermore, the outcome is self-evident. The remarkable achievements made within the given time frame would not have been attained without the collaborative effort between the consultants and the staff. Furthermore, GB believes in transparency, is more than willing to share 
the measurable impacts these consultants have brought about. Prior to the hack, how is the income different now, at least for the last six months? Over the hack, sorry, after the hack, GB's invoicing dropped to 15% of its database. I think those presentations were made back then. And now the company is invoicing 90% of its database, thanks to the significant improvements in billing and collection. And while we still ac acknowledge that that 10% is a challenge and affects human beings, we are asking that those that receive anything that looks like a discrepancy to just report that as soon as possible via the various media. <coughs> this achievement, as was mentioned by the staff, is also testament to the effective collaboration of consultants and staff. Computech received a contract from GB. Was there an open bidding for Computech? What was, are the tasks and responsibilities? NVGB ICT platform already used a world-renowned product to secure its network. In the past, these products were procured via foreign-based third parties. Due to the cyber attack, management deployed a robust security infrastructure to minimize future risks, secure critical data, and preserve the company's ability to service its customers and meet its obligations to stakeholders. <coughs> Consequently, this, strategi this strategic initiative is imperative to fortify GB's resilience against cyber threats and maintain its commitment to serving the people of St. Martin. Computer Tech is the only local authorized dealer for this product and is finalizing the implementation of the new security platform. Since there are no other authorized dealers on the island, a bidding process was not necessary. But I can also add that it is also the, one of the few within the region as well. What is the cost of the crisis team on a monthly basis? During the current state assessment, a crisis team was established by the special representative temporary manager. This officially ended in February 2023 when the results were presented to the Council of Ministers. Currently, the company is being managed by the special representative temporary manager with third party support if deemed necessary. What is GB's reserve for the hurricane season? It's important to note that GB's reserves are still fluctuating and they aren't they haven't reached the level that the company considers to be its threshold. Prior to increasing its compliance, the company used to invoice only 15% of the database while still incurring the same level of expenditures. However, this has changed now and with increased compliance, NVGB is better, has a better chance of reaching its hurricane threshold. Uh, can you update whether we were able to make it? The further questions are, how was GB tested this year? Can we get a better understanding of what I mentioned during the opening statement? Was it another hack? A better breakdown of what is meant is requested. NVGB's ICT infrastructure was breached on July 6th, 18th of 2023. GB is not unlike other large organizations um, subject to site is, yeah. All large organizations are subject to cybercrime. Unfortunately, there is an uptick in the targeting of the region. Historically, organizations have been, that have been successfully breached are relentlessly targeted. Because of the steps the current management has taken since taking office, the company was able to be back online within three business days. So the attempt or the breach was detected. They shut down the system for three days to ensure that they did not uh, mess with the data, and then they were back up. In 2017, BTP was indeed commissioned by the then sitting ministers to do a market research to update on the energy policy. Does that fit here? Hmm? I believe that's an error that part of the answer uh, should be removed from this question, as this question was about the um, understanding about the incident that they had experienced in 2023. I'll go to question nine. Of the 90% of the accounts restored, how many of them are paying their bills percentage-wise? As mentioned, 90% of its database has been restored, and compliance issues are still being faced, resulting here and there by some disconnections. Of 
So I would have uh, the company update on what percentage is actually paying. Is it possible to create a new billing tariff since the billing is restored? Yes, it is possible to set new billing tariffs. However, the relevant research has to be done to see the possibilities on the way forward. Um, and yeah, part of the challenge uh, in our discussion, I must say, this isn't in answers, with NVGEBE, when we were talking about um, bringing down the tariffs that currently exist, um, it was talked about the throughput fees that are being paid via the harbor. And in speaking to the harbor, the harbor explained that they require the throughput fees to be able to meet their obligations, their loans, et cetera. So these were constructs that were put in place back then when the harbors were extended and improved, and that throughput fee is also passed on to NVGB and to the company and to the people of St. Martin. How many of GB's clients are 60 plus? Can it be seen in the system? Um, that cannot be directly seen. Additionally, they, they are not arranged by date of birth. Um, and sometimes some of the clients live with younger persons and are not the main person's name on the list as well. So uh, that would be something they would have to do with the uh, research on. And Peter Weaver asked um, whether the supervisory board is puppeted by government, WB, World Bank, wants to dismiss 30% of the staff. What are we going to do about not interfering? We know that we know why we are here today and never repeat it again. What assurances that we have that staff are not going to be made redundant or given early retirement. The GBE management has made it known that there are no plans to reduce staff. As a matter of fact, I can remember when a question was asked about changing and transitioning to renewable energy, the talk was that, oh, the scare was put into GB's employees that they would become redundant, and the discussion was had that training of existing um, employees would be done to meet whatever changes would be implemented. And as was seen in the previous answer, several new employees were hired. Mm -hmm. When was the last time the shareholder met with GB? I think this is a very old answer. It said July of 2023, but we had a meeting subsequently in November? December. December. In December? I will have to confirm, Madam Chair. Maybe the Secretary General can also check, but I believe we had one towards the end of the year in 2023 as well. The current composition of the supervisory board is four members. Two fill the role of technical operations. One member falls within the financial, and the last is legal. The last that has to still be appointed is legal. In the meantime, they have legal support. The finances, are the obligations being met? Yes, all of the current financial obligations are being met. When is the last time that the concessions were paid? And what is the status? In August of 2023, GB and government agreed to the amount owed for the fiscal year 2022 government outstanding is offset against the concession. So what government owns to GB is then offset against the concession. The financial health uh, is, what is the financial health compared to before the hack? As was mentioned before in the responses to the audited statements and uh, those were completed at the end of the year 23. And in this quarter, by the middle of the year, I think they mentioned they would work on 22 and 22. MP further asks if an investi independent investigation took place, what did it reveal? Uh, MVGB thanked the Member of Parliament for the inquiry regarding the investigation into GB's operations and can confirm that various third party experts conducted assessments and the findings were presented to the COM in February of 2023. Although the investigation revealed certain vulnerabilities in GB systems and processes, it's important to refrain from discussing the specifics of these vulnerabilities in public. The company's focus is on addressing these issues effectively and mitigating any future risks. By doing so, the management can ensure that GB's operations continue to run smoothly and efficiently. However, having said that, the shareholder and the company fully acknowledge the importance of transparency and accountability. To this end, we propose organizing a confidential meeting with 
the shareholder representative to discuss, which is the Council of Ministers, to discuss the findings in detail. This approach will allow us to maintain confidentiality while ensuring that stakeholders are appropriately informed. GB is committed to implementing solutions that align with best market practices and that consider its financial and market interests. It focuses on strengthening its operations and enhancing service delivery, ensuring that the company can operate efficiently and effectively in the best interest of all stakeholders. We, uh, GEB appreciates your, the understanding of the members of parliament and the support of the shareholder, the board, and management working towards making GB a more robust, robust and resilient company. We go now to the questions of MP William Marlin. GB is not just a company, it's one of our strongest strategic assets. It's a company that affects every citizen and business on the island. Um, the MP wanted to know why no conclusion has been reached after this has been ongoing for more than a year. M NVGB recognizes the statement and the concern of the MP, but there was not really a question, and I believe in answering some of the other questions, it is clarified what steps have been taken in the meantime to improve the situation and what are some of the challenges that GB faces in with the last 10 percent. The member further mentioned that GB should find a way to write off some debts if they can prove that their reading of the meters are correct. If GB is saying that the billing is not in sync, then the, pin, the client should not be penalized. GB mentions that it has been trying to resolve customer concerns through amicable solutions and campaigns without penalizing the clients. The third question, what is being done to our statement, or this one is a question, to ensure that consumers aren't paying business class prices, prices and receiving economy class service. NVGB states that it is in constant and direct contact with the community to address customers with open door policy and address their concerns whether it is via telephone, email, live chat, social media, or via direct assistance in its offices with customer care professionals. Additionally, NVGB will introduce a comprehensive public information series, as I mentioned before, to improve their communications to the community. And ensuring to investigate the cost of, or the, the challenges with the billing and any discrepancies that may come forward. So I believe I've come to the end of the questions that were posed in the first round, Madam Chair, um, and I await any further clarifications and questions in the second round. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister, for giving, providing those answers that, the, that have been sent to, to the Parliament. At this time, members of parliament, all members have the opportunity to ask any point of clarification to the answers provided. And we have MP Christophe Emmanuel. MP Emmanuel. M MP Emmanuel. Be Sorry. Before you start, give me um, two minutes adjournment, please. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. You will be up. I'll adjourn for, let's say, three minutes because I realize we, we counted the time. So we're going to take a three minutes adjournment.
I hereby reopen the meeting of parliament after a very brief adjournment and I go over to the points of clarification if needed by any member of parliament and I have MP Christophe Emmanuel who would like to make use of the opportunity to pose a point of clarification. MP Emmanuel. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. And I have a few clarifications, Madam Speaker. And, ma and before I go, Madam Chair, all I'm asking and seeking from GEBE is the truth. Not so much in the answers that was given by the Prime Minister, because I know what the Prime Minister got or what she's reading is from what she received from GEBE. And that's unfortunate. Why is it unfortunate, Madam Chair? Because they have put the Prime Minister in this light to read these answers knowing, Madam Chair, that they are not what it really is. All I'm seeking is the truth. For example, Madam Chair, I took note of all the responses to MP's questions posed to GEBE. Madam Chair, however, I have a few clarifications. Madam Chair, on question six posed by MP Westcott regarding the financials, and this one had me a bit confused. Madam Chair, the company, let's say this was quite a surprise with the answers given by GEBE. GEBE stated that NVGEBE management has built limited cash reserve for operations and unforeseen circumstances. GEBE also stated that the company is maintaining a net positive cash flow position, Madam Chair. So now please clarify to me, Madam Chair, as of today, Madam Chair, GEBE, net primary bank, in other words, their main bank is WIB. Madam Chair, the current balance of NVGEBE WIB account yesterday, as it follows, WIB account in guilders is two million guilders in the negative. Madam Chair, the account in dollars is four million in the negative. Furthermore, Madam Chair, NVGEBE overdraft with WIB is currently nine million guilders in the negative. So in other words, GEBE owes nine million guilders now in overdraft, in overdraft, which was previously eight million, an increase of one million. In addition to that, Madam Chair, the current overdraft that GEBE had with WIB was recently expired and has yet to be renewed. Also, Madam Chair, I would like to bring to your attention that GEBE overall cash flow is totally less than 12 million guilders. The reason why I'm saying this is due to the remaining balance that is currently at a different bank. For example, Madam Chair, Republic Bank, six million guilders in a term deposit and one million guilders on GEBE account. Bank of the Caribbean, GEBE accounts has less than one million guilders on it. RBC, NVGEBE, accounts hold approximately 1.5 million guilders. The dollars hold approximately 2 million guilders. So, Madam Chair, the million dollar question where this is reserved, how much is this reserved, Madam Chair? And please break down for me what net positive cash flow position GEBE is maintaining. Can that be clarified? How is it possible? Can you please provide Parliament with the numbers, Madam Chair? Madam Chair, they walk in and say their cash flow is positive. Can I get a clarification based on all these numbers, all these accounts, all the negative that I just make mention, Madam Chair, that it is positive? Madam Chair, another question that stood out to me was a question from MP Grisha Heiliger Martin, the Honorable MP, regarding the financial viability of the company. Now, Madam Chair, for me, it was very interesting. GEBE responding saying that upon the arrival of the new temporary manager, Mr. Washington, that the company at the time was on the brink of collapse. Thus, in other words, on the road of bankruptcy. But Madam Chair, I am confused. And here's the reason. The previous manager or managers, Ms. Shireen Daniel and Mr. Timmer, 
was made inactive. Madam Chair, NVGEBE bank account balance had approximately 30 million plus on it. And now we have currently less than 12 million. So again, can a breakdown for me be given? Since you're saying that at that time, it was on the, bank, it was on the brink of bankruptcy with a surplus of 30 million, and now you're in the red. Or even less than that, Madam Chair, cannot be clarified. Madam Chair, also, another clarification. Since GEBE claims to have a net positive cash flow, but cannot provide us with numbers, which would be facts, I don't know if the management or the government has taken note that we are approaching the hurricane season. Madam Chair, according to GEBE's concession agreement, the company is required to have 30 million in reserve, or should I say, on the bank account. Madam Chair, it's no public secret this is not the case. So my follow-up question is, what if a natural disaster has occurred right now, Madam Chair, how are we going to see it through? Can GEBE clarify that and give an answer? Also, Madam Chair, I listened to the Honorable Prime Minister response to MP Grisha question number eight regarding the <coughs> hack. And I have asked this question also in letters that I've sent to GEBE, Madam Chair. And still GEBE, Madam Chair, still hasn't been honest and say, yes, we was hacked for the second time. I took note that GEBE and the government, or should I say the Prime Minister, still, Madam Chair, is refusing to be honest. So my clarification question is, was GEBE hacked? And was the data lost? Because, Madam Chair, the Prime Minister used the word breached. But before I allow GEBE to answer that question, Madam Chair, I'm, I, right here in my possession, I have documents. I, I, I have, Madam Chair, the executive summary. So before I read the executive summary, Madam Chair, I would like to give GEBE the opportunity to clarify it. To clarify it, because if I have the executive summary of what happened in detail as of July the 19, 2023, between July the 18th and July the 19, 2023, I have the executive summary. Yes, because what is happening here, Madam Chair, is that the management of GEBE is hiding the truth. And here walks in the Prime Minister, making the Prime Minister and the government look bad. Not that I have to feel for them, Madam Chair, but what I'm saying, be honest. Be honest, Madam Chair. So before I read it, come for clarifications or anything in the second rounds, I want to give GEBE, Madam Chair, the opportunity for them to clarify it, whether we was hacked for the second time or not. And my last clarification question, Madam Chair, regarding this matter is, wasn't the company NetPro that saved the company was recruited and signed by the former temporary manager, Dr. Daniels, and not by the current manager? I thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Christophe Emmanuel. I am still in clarifications, and MP Grisha Heiliger, you have the floor during this time of clarifications. A pleasant good afternoon to you, Madam Chair Lady, to the Secretary General, to the Prime Minister and her support staff and the representatives of GEBE, my fellow colleagues and those in the Tribune. Good afternoon to everyone. Madam Chair Lady, through you I'd like to ask a few clarification questions, but MP, as usual, MP Emmanuel have already touched on a few of them, but I'll still, you know, ask mine because it's a little different, but it's still pertaining to the same thing. And it is regarding the um, question um, regarding MP Westcott Williams, uh, question, question number six, in which GB responded saying that GB management has a limited um, cash reserve. Um, please clarify the amount of this cash reserve and how much was done and accomplish to have this cash reserve. In addition, I'd like to also have seek some clarification on um, the breakdown and how GB is maintaining that net positive cash flow where there is, um, I was made to understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'd like 
to be corrected if I'm wrong, I was made to understand that seemingly a hefty amount of outstanding in accounts receivable, there's still an, um, a hefty amount of outstanding in accounts receivable, and um, the billing system is yet to be completed, and there's still a significant amount of people that has to be billed. So I would like clarity on this, uh, on this as well, on this positive cash flow they kept referring to. The question um, that from former MP Rolando Bryce in question seven, that in three months management turned the company around. I also have a question there. How was this achieved? And what are the implications? And um, what is the current outstanding debt of GP? And what are, are its revenues right now? Another question from MP, the former MP Rolando Bryson regarding cyber, cyber um, security infrastructure more than 75% um, complete. Is it now 100% complete? And uh, another one that was posed by MP Ramul, question 11, to me the answer is not that clear, as I was made to understand, and can, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that since the head of the department was placed on non-active leave, that, department, that the department was basically shut down. And as a result, it, is it fair to say that uh, no internal audit has been taken place? And can the Prime Minister, through you, Madam Chair Lady, please clarify, considering that for the past two years only, the only audit that took place was um, that of the warehouse risk assessment with Grant Thornton. Thor Thornton. And lastly, my question, question seven, regarding the fluctuation. Um, Percentage-wise, right now, the fluctuation of the threshold. Percentage-wise, right now, how far are you, how close are you to meeting that threshold? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. The Prime Minister wishes to make a comment. Prime Minister. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Yes, I did not catch what MP mentioned, which question uh, that was related to internal audits. I'm not sure whose question or which number it was that she's referring to that needed clarify. MP, could you repeat that one, please? Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Internal audits. The first, you mean my first one? Was MP, the ones from MP, MP Westcott Williams regarding the cash flow, and then you have the, oh, the last one. That was my question, question seven, regarding the threshold, the, the fluctuation of the threshold, that it's been fluctuating, and I want to know percentage-wise. I said something on internal audit. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That was MP Ramu. Um, question 11 of MP Ramu. As a result, it is, fair to, is it fair to say that no internal audits has been taken place? And can the Prime Minister please clarify, considering that for the past two years, the only uh, um, audit that took place was a warehouse risk assessment with Grant Thornton. Thornton. Just correct me if I'm wrong on that statement. Should I repeat it again or clear? Thanks. Thank you, MP Grisha Heiliger, for clarifying your clarification question. And I now we continue, and I offer MP Melissa Gums the opportunity to ad um, address an issue during this session, this part. MP thank Gums. you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> And good afternoon to everyone, and thank you to the Prime Minister for the answers. I just had one point of clarification, Madam Chair, actually on a question, uh, an answer in response to a question from MP Ramu on renewable energy sources. The Prime Minister, through you, Madam Chair, mentioned a feasibility study uh, that is being done, and the answer reads, in collaboration with the NRPB. But if I'm correct in my understanding, there is an existing agreement with Grid Market to produce the, a renewable energy map already. So I'd like to know if that is the study, if it's uh, the same thing that we're talking about um, from NRPB in connection with grid market and GEBE, and if not, uh, if the Prime Minister could clarify, then is the grid market partnership still happening or is it no longer of interest uh, to the country? Thank you. Uh, thank you, MP Melissa Gums, for those clarification questions. I look now to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, would you need any time to go over these Clarification questions. Need a brief adjournment or you can respond. Prime Minister, your response please.
We have uh, 15 to 20 minutes to see what can be answered uh, directly. Uh, Madam Chair. Okay, then um, members of parliament, prime minister and support staff, I will adjourn this meeting until 12.30, giving the prime minister approximately 20 minutes to um, provide answers to the questions that were posed to be clarified by members of parliament. So members of parliament, viewing public and listening public, Prime Minister, this meeting is hereby adjourned until 12.30 p.m.
I hereby briefly reopen the meeting just to inform everyone that rather than at 12.30, we're now going to resume with the answers from the Prime Minister and GEBE in about the next 15 minutes. So we're looking at 10 minutes to one. One, sorry, 12.50. So the meeting will reconvene at 10 minutes to one or 12.50 p.m.
Members of Parliament, listeners, viewers, those in the Tribune here at Parliament Building, Prime Minister and support staff, GB representatives, good afternoon and welcome back to the continuation of this public meeting of Parliament on the topic of GEBE. We were at a stage where the answers in the first round were provided and clarifications were then sought on the answers provided and the Prime Minister took a brief adjournment to now respond to the questions for clarification. Prime Minister, I give you the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to respond to the clarifications as posed by the several members of Parliament. Um, as to the question from MP Emanuel regarding the statements being made as to information that he has procured through means that are quite questionable, I would like to say that this is indeed a dangerous situation, Madam Chair that has been perpetrated, especially seeing that confidential information um, regarding bank accounts of NVGB is being made public in this forum. I think I've been here more than once in Parliament discussing role of Parliament, role of government, etc. And um, this, what has been shared, is a snapshot of GEB accounts which fluctuates on a daily basis. And the statements as well as the information can cause unnecessary concern to those who may not understand the significance of having overdraft facilities that the bank has afforded GEBE based on its confidence in it being able to generate certain revenues. Um, as such, Madam Chair, if further information is required as to cash flow, et cetera, um, I would prefer to have that discussion in another setting. The next question was how much is this reserve and what net positive cash flow position is GB providing? So basically in terms of the cash flow or the presentation that um, the responses that they had provided based on the facilities provided and the constant fluctuation of income via its billing, et cetera, um, that is where the definition or definition of positive, uh, what was the word? Positive, cash flow being positive means. So access to cash and liquidity. How much is this reserve? What net positive cash flow position is GB providing? The information, as I said just now, would not be provided in this public forum, Madam Chair. And I hope that, I'm fine. It's just a short thing. Um, with the, you know, training, et cetera, bottom, that sure. have been provided. One minute, please, um, Prime Minister. MP Madam, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, lady, this is a clarification round. I am asking clarification on answers that they give to question that was sent to them, Madam Chair. It can be in no other setting and no other nothing, Madam Chair, lady, please. And this is what GEBE does when they come in here with the Prime Minister. The last time they did it, the questions they did it, and they're doing it again, Madam Chair, lady. This is clarification. It can't be that you're going to answer a clarification in some other setting. You give the answer, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, MP. Emmanuel, for raising that matter. I'm sure the Prime Minister has taken note of your comments, and Prime Minister, I invite you to continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I was stating, corporate governance determines what should be shared, when and where and how, and in the interest of protecting the integrity of the company, NVGB, which is a public company, yes, but not all information, can be shared with the public. I thought that was clearly explained when we had the corporate governance training in here. Um, leaking this kind of information could potentially damage GEBE's reputation with potential investors, suppliers, as well as the staff, whose daily bread is actually dependent on GB remaining viable. 
So I don't know if it is the intention to hurt GEBE, but as I stated before, I think I've clarified what the positive uh, cash flow, what was meant by that in terms of the available liquidity, fire facilities, as well as the cash on other banks. Financial viability of the company in question, referring to a question from MP Martin Helliger, what um, that the company, a response that the company was on the verge of Point of bankruptcy. Yeah. MP Emmanuel. Is there something you want to say? Sorry? Go ahead. No, I was going to say to you, rather than use the point of order, let the Prime Minister finish in the clarifications, and remember, we still have a second round. No, but point, no, Madam Chair, that can, no, 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 Madam Chair, I cannot use my second round clarification for thing that was asked in the first round, Madam Chair Lady. This is the first round to the question that was asked to them that the Prime Minister is answering in the first round, Madam Chair. In clarification, Madam Chair, this is what I'm saying. They gave the answers. I am asking them. They said that the reserves are there. I give them other numbers that say where, Madam Chair Lady. It can't be that the Prime Minister pull it up, corporate this and Then don't give no answer then, Madam Chair. So members of parliament shouldn't do research, shouldn't get information. Madam Chair Lady, the Prime Minister can say whatever she wants. Thank you, MP. But confidential is confidential. Thank you. You give the answers. Thank you, MP. Madam Chair, this can't be. Emmanuel. If we can't get answers, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. The Prime Minister is indicating what answers she is given, she will be given. And I would suggest that the Prime Minister finishes her answers and based on your observations, MP Emmanuel, we then as Parliament decide what it is we want to do. That I, and I understand that. And I'm on question three, Madam Chair. Hold on, one, both of you a moment. Um, <laughs> Prime Minister Jacobs, you are on question three, MP Emmanuel. I would suggest that we allow the Prime Minister to finish the Thank answers you, to the Chair. clarification questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll repeat what was being read uh, in question three, in the clarification question three from the Honorable MP. And it was in clarifying an answer that was given to MP Grisha Helena Marling, Martin regarding the company being on the road to bankruptcy and mentioning that the former management was inactive when 20 million in cash was on the account and now they are in 30 million, correction, plus was on the account. I'm quoting what is typed here as the question that was written. And now they are in the red. Can this be clarified? The reserves of 30 million that was in place um, as I mentioned in previous presentations here, based on the burn rate, which has been ex explained as the monthly expenses exceeding the revenues at that time by about six million per month. If we do that calculation from September to December, January, um, it would have been completely eroded. So because we were only billing 15% of our customers and not all of the rest were paying into their account, the amount of revenues being generated in August 2022, September 2022, was at six million per month loss. If we can understand five times six is 30, that would mean that 30 million in cash would be gone had certain actions not been taken. That is the explanation and the clarification to that. The management was able to secure at that time, there was no overdraft facility, there was just the 30 million in cash, and the management was able to secure a facility, overdraft facility, which gave the needed breathing room to be able to make priority payments, which as we remember back then, is Sol being paid? Is this one being paid? Is that one being paid? I'm sure we remember that story very well, Madam Chair, and that is being handled that was being handled at the time, and at this time, the 
It has also reduced the dependency on the cash. So the management prefers to use the facility and keep a certain amount of cash in case of um, emergencies and urgent needs. Though of course it is still not back up to the 30 million. The next question, question four, Madam Chair, relates to the upcoming hurricane season and the exact same reserve we were discussing. What if a natural disaster occurs now? What will GEBE do? The threshold that was mentioned because was, again, at the time, GB was also underinsured. However, currently, GB is better insured and will continue to strive to meet that threshold um, for the reserves needed in case of disasters. Concerning the hack, excuse me, Madam Chair. GB still has not. Uh, the member mentions that GB was not honest about the second hack. Was it hacked? Was data lost? I used the word breach. The, me the member mentioned that I used the word breach in my answer that was provided by NVGEBE. And he has an executive summary which he plans to read and seeks clarity from GEBE. As was mentioned in 2023, I will say again, a breach was reported, which was an attempted hack. So yes, an attack was made on the system. When the attack was detected, the system was shut down for three days. It was a Wednesday, I believe, and they were back up on Monday. They did a complete assessment. So we lost three working days by which we would be able to collect daily revenue. So that's definitely the loss that we incurred during that time as NVGEBE. However, the attempt was unsuccessful in that it did not create any lost data as per the answers provided by NVGEBE. And if I was on the other side, Madam Chair, I mean, not this time, I usually hear it in the media. Um, information that is provided by the company, as was mentioned, is shared here with Parliament in as much as it can be verified. And so sometimes I can remember in the past, I would say, well, I wouldn't give this or that answer because I cannot verify. And this answer, of course, we're sitting at a table here together and generating the answer. So I did not go back, nor did management go back to anyone to seek any further answers. This was generated right here today. Yes? The sixth question in clarifications was related to the company NetPro that saved the company and was not recruited and contracted, not recruited by this management, but contracted by the former management and not this current one. Uh, that's good to know for the record, I guess, if others didn't know, um, but I think we said that here as well. So while the former management did sign the contracts, it did not start doing any work until the new temporary management was in place. So the onboarding of that company started under the interim management. And during that course, management also decided to enhance the product um, that had already been agreed upon to better serve GEBE's needs. Then I go to the questions of uh, the clarification of MP Grisha Helga Martin. She also referred to who also referred to question six from MP Westcott in terms of the limited cash reserve, how much was done and how was it accomplished? Um, again, when management took over, there was a 15% billing. It was raised to up until now 90%, 90 plus percent of the database with follow-up to ensure compliance. That follow-up to ensure compliance has reduce that six million uh, deficit in revenue generation or collections to now that in the last two months, Madam Chair, January and February, um, the monthly income or collections of GEBE is actually slightly higher than the last normal month, which was February of 2022. So we're well on our way to being able to get back to the norm 
and therefore then hopefully make the necessary investments that NVGEBE needs. Second, how was the positive cash flow maintained? How hefty amounts still there in the accounts receivable and there's still amount of people to be collected or billed, sorry. MP1's clarity. So the correction in bills, I think we already clarified, is down to 10% of the total amount of persons. Due to the fact that the company has been able to maintain increase in collections, and this has been done by more customers coming in, coming online with a payment plan, as well as making payments. This also reflects the receivables, and it shows how much GB, the receivables amount shows how much GB still has to collect for energy provided across the island. I think question three related to the financial health um, is the similar question that I just responded to. Four, what is the current debt right now and the reserves? The only current facility that GB has is the fluctuating overdraft. So as I mentioned before, there are no loans loans, but the fluctuating overdraft, you can consider a loan in the case of um, anything if you want to do an assessment. And GB is in the process of updating that facility as is a standard operating procedure that the bank does on a yearly basis. And to go more in depth on the finances, I would prefer to do that in a different setting. Thank you. Glad you understand. Is the cybersecurity infrastructure now at 100%? As it was stated, it was stated as 75% before. The cybersecurity infrastructure is still being fine-tuned, so we wouldn't say it's 100%, uh, but we'll be, we'll be able to give further information later on this month when that um, exercise is completed, and this will be shared with the shareholder to then determine what can be disseminated. MP removes question, I believe, number 11. Need a clarification as well, return uh, re related to the internal audit. Oh, that no internal audit has taken place was the only audit the warehouse risk assessment by Grant Thornton for the last two years. The internal audit department was given uh, a couple of assignments, including a risk assessment to be conducted, and they were given the necessary support by Grant Thornton in this endeavor. So the Grant Thornton is supporting the internal audit department. The percentage of how far we are from the threshold, I think it's the same 30 million threshold we're referring to from one of the other questions that were asked. As I mentioned before, that is something a little more uh, confidential to be shared, but indeed it is clear that um, Persons are able to, within their research, get into the financials of government companies, and I would want to hope that the information is not erroneously interpreted by the public, as well as GB stakeholders to the detriment of GEBE and its future sustainability. MP Remo, sorry, MP Gums asked a question related to MP removes question on renewable energy sources and the feasibility study. There is an existing agreement with Grade Market that government has signed. Uh, is this the same thing? So relating to the feasibility study being done by GEBE with assistance from the NRPB, is this different than the one with the NRPB? The roadmap for the transition to renewable energy that government commissioned via grid market and approved still lacked some key information from GEBE, specific information that they are currently finalizing through their studies, which are being done with assistance from the NRPB and the TNO. And this is to specifically assess their grid reliability and exactly what product mix is most feasible for GEBE to transition to renewable energy. So the roadmap that we have says St. Martin can do X, Y, and Z based on our, you know, rain, water, sun, 
um, et cetera, and suggest how to do so. But the plugging in of the actuals based on what the capacity of GB is, et cetera, was lacking from that. So that information is still necessary and hopefully will be finalized within shorts, correct? It started yesterday and will be hopefully finished in three months. So I do have a timeline on that one. Madam Chair, those were the clarification questions as far as um, I could be able to record with the assistance of the staff. And um, again, when I made statements such as this, I'm also a member of this body, Madam Chair. And I think we have to be very responsible in the manner in which we share information with the public and in what context we do so. Because it cannot be just to um, you know, gain brownie points or whatever the case may be. It has to be with the, with the intention to keep our government-owned companies for which we are yes to hold government accountable, viable. So I thank you for the opportunity to have been responding um, on behalf of NDGB and Government of St. Martin to the questions and clarifications posed. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister, for those clarifications. Members of Parliament, the, we now go over to the second round in this meeting on this agenda point. And as I explained at the start of this meeting, the, we go according to the speaker's list, which was signed up for the first round. Only four members here present made use of the opportunity to speak in the first round. And I just wish to remind all members again that, of course, Given the answers to be provided now in the second round, you, any of you, may ask for a clarification to be to be addressed. The I will also I will also review the answers given by the by the Prime Minister in terms of assessing the necessity to convene another meeting, especially on the information that the Prime Minister indicated uh, might be confidential. But that I will do as I analyze the answers that have been given thus far based on the questions posed by, and on the questions posed by members of parliament. So um, just to be clear again, the, I would have been one of the persons who spoke in the first round. However, also given the additional questions that the members have asked, the other members, I believe that my answers too will be given with the additional questions to be asked by members of parliament. So right now, it would, it would have been myself as a speaker, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin, MP Lutmila de Weaver, and MP Gums. And excluding myself, I now give MP Grisha Heiliger Martin the floor. Just a reminder, MP, rem remember that this is the, in this round, we have 15 minutes because the time was adjusted. Um, MP Heiliger Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Good afternoon to everyone. I just have a few questions as a follow-up to some of the answers that was posed in round one. And some questions just to maybe going back in memory lane, because I'm sure we've posed some of these questions, but just to refresh in my memories, I might have some questions that I need um, to be re-answered again, because I'm sure we've spoken of, of a few of these things, but just bear with me through you, Madam Chair, Lady, if I can just pose these questions just for me to get an understanding of um, what's at stake right now. And one of those refreshing my memory type questions is uh, how much funding did GB received from the World Bank and what specific purpose were these funds allocated for? And um, is it a grant or a loan? What is the lifespan of the generations currently in use? My next question is what type of fuel is GB currently utilizing for the electricity, um, electricity generation? And does the, does the GB have any cyber security insurance as of now? And what percentage of GB revenues were impacted by the attack? 
and how many consultants does GB employ and what are their areas of speciali specialization? Additionally, what is the compensation for these consultants? With regards to security measures, were security measures implemented by management to prevent the attacks? Are these regular audits and updates? Are there regular audits or updates to ensure the system's integrity? And considering the previous attacks in 2022 and 2023, can the current management team guarantee that a similar attack will not occur in 2024? With regards to the financial impact, what is the financial impact of the hack on the company right now? How will it affect revenues, profits, and shareholders' concession fees? What is the amount outstanding for commercial and industrial customers? And if you, if you have to answer them uh, discreetly, I, I'll understand. And how much um, is the outstanding for residential customers? Regarding board oversight, I'd like to ask a, few, um, a question. How will the board of directors exercise oversight over the cybersecurity measures and management decisions to mitigate future risks? Right now, with regards to the customers, and, and this is something we'd be, that we've spoken over and over and over and over again in, um, in, 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 in Parliament and in general, hearing it on the road, you know, the, the current arrangement is causing a lot of stress on the customers, and I'm sure GB is aware of it. You, you hear horror stories of a person going in there saying, you want to take my entire salary, how am I going to live, how am I going to survive? You know, just like a bank, when you go and you take a loan, the bank looks at 35% of your, your salary that they can take for, that they can grant you a loan. I mean, GB is just telling them plain out, 900 gillas, I don't care where you're getting the money from, this is what you have to pay, because that's the feeling and the sentiment out there right now. And we've discussed this many times. So with that, again, I will ask, because that is still happening today. This week, someone flipped in, the, in, in, in a lady came in there with a child, and she went crazy, ballistic, because she's asking GB, how do you want me to pay this? So my question to you, given all of this that is still relevant to this week, what arrangements can GB make with customers who have outstanding bills that will be least stressful for them? How does GB measure customer satisfaction and what initiatives are in place to improve it? With that in mind. With regards to the future outlook of GB, what is the company's outlook for growth and profitability in the coming years, considering factors such as market trends, technological advancement, and regulatory changes? What is management doing to avert possible layoffs? has just happened with another company, government-owned company. I heard um, the Prime Minister through you, Madam Chair, lady stated that that is not what they are, um, that that's not at all what they are um, looking to do, but still, what are you doing to mitigate if it's, it can happen possibly? That maybe, you know, God forbid. Is there a plan in place to mitigate that? Also, it seems like GB mentioned that they often learn about new developments in the newspaper. That was in one of the answers uh, in the round one. And it, this makes it difficult for them to plan production if they're unaware of these developments. What steps are being taken by government to ensure that they are informed about these new projects? Customers have expressed dissatisfaction regarding the fuel clause. That's another thing that is constantly being talked about and that the, the fuel clause is, being, is higher than the electricity consumption fee. Could, through you, Madam Chair, Lady, the Prime Minister, please explain this. So what are they doing to maybe focus and zoom in on re reducing the fuel clause? What can be done? What steps are being taken for the renewable energy initiatives? I heard it earlier, but it's still not clear to me. Is there a plan in place, and what is the timeline for this transition? What is the relationship between GEBD, GEBE and EDF, our utility company in the north? Any kind of um, uh, cohesion, any kind of projects you're doing together? And my last question through you, Madam Chair Lady, is, uh, is GB financially affiliated with prominent international lending institution, and what is the proportion of the loans acquired from foreign banks compared to local banks and pension funds? Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. 
Thank you, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin, for your questions. And of course, I continue with the list of speakers on this topic, and I invite MP Lutmila De Weaver to take the floor. MP De Weaver, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to you, to the Prime Minister here and her team and representatives from GB, uh, my colleagues, viewing and listening public. Madam Chair, Lady, I just wanted to sort of give a, a little bit of an idea of the questions that are coming, that I'm going to ask. They have come from outside. Um, <clears throat> and the way that they have been phrased has been sort of like a commentary as opposed to question. So what I will do is proceed to read them off, um, adjust them in a, in a question format. Um, and pretty much for all eight questions, I can send them to the Prime Minister and team in writing. But what I would like is, um, uh, is this true or false sort of um, request or question? That's the, the line that I'm coming from. And again, I'm going to read verbatim um, from the questions that have been sent to me because I did not have sufficient time to really go through and transfer them or adjust them in a way uh, as much as I can to be still protective. Um, why, okay, so let, let's start off. We, uh, we do not have sufficient power at the plant for SXM, for St. Martin, and yet when the manager screams, he is ignored. Is that correct? Is that a correct statement? The IT department is in complete chaos. Someone under an external consultant, uh, external consulting company has been brought in as the manager of the department on a consultancy basis. He is rarely here and never answers emails when workers have issues. He does not sit where his workers are, but he sits in management building. He is very arrogant and looks down at the workers. Is that a correct statement? Management often, oftentimes looks down at the GB workers and complains about them, yet the consultancy team from India makes a lot of mistakes and they are very much respected. Is that correct? Human resources department is in shambles. Too much favoritism and judgment of persons. Is that correct? The customers department still can't get everything under control. They have, consult they have consultants there already for a year and still can't get it done. How ironic they ran who was there after six months, yet this management is there going on two years and still can't get it done. The fuel, the fuel clause is not at all times issued based on what it should be to the customers. Isn't this mismanagement? My, uh, my question is, is the statement correct? The finance department gets away with murder. Oftentimes, the manager is in disagreement with the director. Who suffers, of course, only the company? Is the statement correct? And um, it's as if BDO is running, sorry, external consulting company is running the company. They are in every facet of the company of GEBE. However, everyone knows that the director from both companies are best friends. Is this correct? And then lastly, why is it that a specific construction company is the one that gets most of the work from GB? Uh, you have a different person than the director approving, but here is not where the problem lies. It lies in who issues the work. Is this statement correct? And in, I take note of the fact that perhaps not all answers can come uh, publicly. I will take the answers privately as well, um, if that is allowed. Because what this tells me when I'm getting questions like this, and in the years that I have been in this position as a member of parliament, I hardly have ever asked questions that I didn't really properly vet. But what this has given me a preview into is the fact that you still have a little bit of um, discourse, uncertainty, chaos happening internally within the company if you don't really have proper leadership and proper communication and basically just proper cooperation across all lines. If you have a company that feels that everyone else outside of the company is doing the work, so that is external consultants, whoever it is you hire to do anything across the board, whether it's finance, whether it's IT, whether it's working at the power plant um, as you know, an external company like the one Mark Silla that we all know of, you know, fuel supplier. I'm talking across the board because again, my questions come from a business perspective, from a financial perspective. A big part of the success of a company happens when people are happy, when the workers are happy, when the workers feel appreciated, when the workers have the resources they need to get the work done. So my concern here now, getting all these questions, which is not a secret to any of us, they're coming from internal, is how are you handling all of this chaos happening in, internally? Because to me, this, is a little bit foreshadowing 
of what is happening with a telecommunication company like Telem, and I don't want to be in the same position there where we have to have a closed door meeting because you know certain drastic decisions have to be taken because of, of bad decision making internally to manage a company. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Lutmila de Weaver, for those questions. And now we have the last MP to speak in the second round of questions is MP Melissa Gums. MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. I just have two questions after reviewing the answers that have been received um, from the first round. Um, and that's mostly regarding cost cutting because there's still a very worrying picture that has been painted uh, for me. So I'm asking uh, much to piggyback off of what MP De Weaver said so that we do not end up in another scenario as is currently occurring uh, right across um, the road. What measures is GB actually putting into place uh, to protect against that? And secondly, uh, in terms of carrying capacity, I know that the feasibility study for renewable energy and such is being done, but uh, as the public will have noted, I've asked some questions regarding very large-scale commercial developments that are all scheduled to come online within the next year and a half, and I just want to know from a carrying capacity perspective, is GB in a position to be able to handle that load, uh, as well as the existing uh, load, and will we see load shedding happening as the hotter months start to come upon us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. MP Melissa Gums. Before I give the word to the Prime Minister, firstly to indicate how much time she deems necessary for the answering of the questions, I just want to comment on a statement by MP Lutmila de Weaver, or rather a proposal, and that was that if her questions cannot be answered, they could be answered to her privately. But I just want to remark that questions posed in here would have to be responded to Parliament. And the, of course, in giving the answers, the minister in question can request that they be held in confidence. But it would be that Parliament would have to receive them. So um, with that comment, I look to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, can you immediately respond on the time that you will need to answer these questions, or you are able to go into the answers at once? Prime Minister. So for some of the questions, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity um, and to the members of parliament for their questions. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I would have loved to just go into the answers right away. Uh, however, there are some questions that management uh, sees it necessary to go back to the different managers on related to some of the questions asked. And uh, I do believe MP Helga Martin also mentioned that if the responses would require more confidentiality, that that would be the case. But I would like to then ask the members of parliament, at least in future, if you already suspect that a question would be of that, so you don't have the public anticipating an answer that they cannot actually be privy to um, at this stage, that then it be sent in writing from the get-go. So. I would just like to, to ask that. Uh, but for, of course, for the ones that have been asked there, I will do my best to answer as much as possible. Within this forum, um, I'm scanning to see if there's anything. Mm -hmm. And some of the questions we didn't get yet in writing from, I believe, is MP the Weaver. So I think I heard, in listening to some of the questions, I heard an, an MP, Grisha Marlin, did mention that it may have been Martin. Did I say Marlin again? My apologies. I, um, I heard some of the questions that we had to some extent answered before. But I will just leave it then. Um, he, Mr. Washington mentioned two, two weeks. Because I myself am not available, as you know during next week. So let's say in two weeks for sure, we'll be able to give the answers to these questions. Oh, sorry, yes. hmm? One moment, Madam Chair. Huh? 
So the week of the 18th seems feasible, Madam Chair, if that can be arranged. Let yes, me, I know we have a lot of meetings that week already. Let me understand, um, Prime Minister, are you able to go into some of the answers now or none at all at this stage from the second round? Madam Prime. Yeah, I heard you. I'm scanning. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> um, yeah, some of these require. <clears throat> the one that I heard, MP. Future Outlook. Who asked that question? You? The one related to, I know the one related to the fuel clause, I attempted to respond to. Uh, a few minutes ago, in the sense that the fuel clause is tied to the throughput fee that GEBE pays to the harbor. And the harbor, uh, so they contacted government, GEBE, to see what we could do about it, since the harbor is also a government-owned company, uh, in relation to the reduction of that or elimination of that. And uh, the harbor reiterated that they were not able to reduce that based on the fact that it was part of their uh, financing agreement to be able to afford their loans. So basically the expansion of the harbor, the port, and the bridge has created that constant need to service the loans, um, which is being passed on via the throughput fee. So this is something that I believe has to be, and I just learned this towards the end of last year, and so this is something that I believe we need to just reassess in whether we need to reevaluate their loans. They also have other expansions they want to do but at the moment it's tied up in those same throughput fees. So if we remove the throughput fees that GB has to pay, which is passed on to the consumer, then that means then the harbor can't afford their loans. So we have to figure out um, as government uh, and its entities the best way to alleviate the stress on the people of St. Martin. I don't know if it was foreseen back then when those expansions took place, how it would negatively impact every individual um, with uh, having to pay for those throughput fees for fuel. And um, <clears throat> as it relates to the layoffs, again, that's not the intention. And getting the company back on its feet is, is happening. So therefore, uh, in the transitioning, as I mentioned before, to renewable energies, the company's goal is to ensure that the persons hired will be trained to take up the new functions that would arise if you move away from fossil fuels. Yes, I, I think Madam Chair, the rest would require not me to just add lib off the top of my head, but to actually get that information from NVGB and the uh, management teams. So I would like to request that more time is given for that. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Before I respond to that request in the way I want to respond to it in terms of time, I want to ask if there is, if there is a need to be granted some more time now so that the Prime Minister can get the information and answer some more questions during this session. So would you, are there any questions? And I look at GB's reps and ask, are there any of the questions posed that if you get 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever the case may be, you can inform the prime minister who can then answer them this afternoon. Is that, is that the case for any, I, I see, I allow you to just caucus a minute on that.
Madam Prime Minister. The company would prefer with the balance. Uh, he was looking for one that re related to types of fuel, but I wasn't able to find it. But I did see in the meantime one related to also from MP Helga Martin, Martin um, about GB not getting the information timely as to new developments. It's related also to MP Gums's question. Um, and that they said that they are now reaching out to Vromi to get updates on uh, when building permits or are requested and or granted so that they can have an overview stretching out. So I did respond to that one in the previous uh, questions that they are mitigating that now by reaching out to the Ministry of Romi. The so I don't think 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes would be sufficient time to get the answers to the other questions. Okay, thank you, Prime Minister. That is noted. Was the suggestion from the management of GEBE that the, these answers be provided in a session on the 18th of this month or in the week of the 18th? Then I would want to, Prime Minister, you may answer that. Yes, indeed. Management of GB did mention the week of the 18th, but I would like to also have the opportunity to sit with the Secretary General of COM to ensure that that works, because she did remind me that there were several other meetings being planned, including shareholders' meetings during that week as well. So that could prove to be a bit tight, maybe not for GB, but for me. Then I want to humbly ask the shareholder of GEBE, the government of St. Martin, and GB's management to please caucus on this matter and find a way to respond next week, God's willing. And whatever needs to be rescheduled that that be done, I will make it possible for us to have that meeting during a so-called non-meeting week. So please don't look at Parliament's schedule to suggest a scheduling of this meeting. So I am not going to discard the fact that Parliament can request a meeting or not request it, convene a meeting during a non-meeting week, which next week is. And I therefore would ask you, both parties to, I would ask both parties to sit and work together because I really would like to get updated information on GEBE, not only for Parliament, but for the people of St. Martin, and then let us move on, be able to close this meeting and move on, and if necessary, convene a meeting on a specific matter that or two that regard GEBE. And I am asking the cooperation of the government of St. Martin, the shareholder, and GEBE to please do their utmost that this, this meeting can continue and be finalized next week. Prime Minister? Yes, Madam Chair. I, I think I did mention that I am uh, on a business travel during the early part of the week. And when I am returning, wouldn't give me enough time to re liaise with GEBE for the 15th. So I would like to suggest, as uh, Mr. Washington, he said the week of the 18th, seeing that we are still trying to reschedule um, some of those meetings I mentioned at the Council of Ministers level, I would like to suggest Monday the 18th, which is just past the Friday, or the Friday would be the only day I would be able to, and I don't want to cut it too close that I don't get the answers and peruse them in time. So and can that we is suggest the 18th? I, I don't want to um, belabor the point too much, but is are you saying that coming Friday might be cutting it in terms of getting the answers? I need I, I really need um, GEBE to work with me on this one because um, persons have been looking forward to, to this meeting, hoping to get answers. You heard the comments and the questions, additional questions from members of parliament. So I'm really asking GEBE to take the time out with those persons who can provide the concrete answers to, to the parliament and 
I'm not going to make it a, 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 a issue Friday or Monday, but I would like to say that if we can get it done on Friday, we can have the, the meeting, the continuation of this meeting next Friday, given um, just over a week for GEBE and government to respond. I can't imagine, and if that be the case, then please say so, that a question would require more than that time. Just listening to the questions, I can't imagine that. But I would suggest, if that be the case, and really more time is needed, then please put that in your answers, and then I would have to consider that to be what it is. So, can we strive for Friday next week, Prime Minister? Madam Chair, I think, I don't know if you misunderstood. I said that based on my, I didn't know, I don't know whether they're able to do it in a week. They could strive to get it done for the week. But my inavailability until I get back to the island on the 14th late is what I am looking at in terms of preparing for said meeting. So the reason I requested Monday was for that reason. And I understood just now from... Uh, Cassandra, that the dude is also on the 15th. So I will do my best, Madam Chair, and inform you accordingly, but I already see it being a bit difficult. Thank you for the considerations. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister, Minister of General Affairs, and I will, I will put it this way. I'll await your, your response, and um, I will definitely, by the 18th, of this month, um, schedule the continuation of this meeting so that we can finish with it. And the, so again, this meeting will be adjourned I, the, until, for the notice, until that date is determined. I want to thank the members of parliament for their presence and participation. I want to thank the prime minister and her support staff here this afternoon, um, the SG of the COM, um, Mrs. Janssen, the, the persons representing GEBE, Mr. Washington and Mr. Richardson, and of course my own support staff, our support staff, thank you all, and this meeting on GEBE is hereby adjourned. <laughs>